Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House alongside my co-host, as always, Mr. Martin Popoff. Greetings from New York, Martin. How are things in yes. Canada today? How you doing? How you doing? Yeah, look, looking forward to it. We had, we, you know, people don't know this, but we've had a long chat already before the show started <laughs> on, on, on a bunch of different things. So uh, we, <laughs> we have, have a, a pretty Martin and I usually get to start a little today. earlier than we did today, but uh, you yeah, know, it's yeah. the first, uh, first show of the new year and uh, we were kind of already talking about uh, future episodes and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, we've already had 25 minutes to chat here before uh, we actually record this. So we're, yeah, we're yeah. well lubricated and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I'm actually a little late because, uh, cause on, uh, you know, on this episode, which won't give away the, what it's about, but I was looking for my Christopher cross promo TV dinner tray, um, which, which kind of fits with this episode. And, uh, and one, one I didn't tell you is that I just threw away my, uh, my Patrick Marat's, uh, in the sun or whatever promo sunglasses because it also fit for this but I threw them away because I was looking at it and and the whole image of of that on the on the um, lens has completely faded away and it's like now it's just oh. a stupid plastic set of thun- sunglasses it's I don't worthless. need these anymore it's certainly cool. don't need to display them anymore but uh, <clears throat> yeah but they, they both kind of fit with this episode but I'll, I'll let you talk about what it yeah is. I'm just thinking Christopher Cross uh, TV dinner tray so I guess back in the 80s uh, people were eating a lot of TV dinners actually I see people eat a lot of TV dinners still today although they don't actually call them TV dinners anymore but uh, could you just imagine Every single day you get an image of Christopher Cross sitting on your tray while you're trying to eat, that would get a little old pretty quick. Yeah, I, yeah. So, I can't uh, remember why it was either. Maybe maybe he had a song about it or an album or something, or maybe it was a video that he did, but yeah. Or maybe or maybe they just uh, they just wanted you to sing <laughs> sailing every day while you're eating your dinner. I don't know. Yeah, could you yeah. imagine? <sighs> Um, I have nothing against Christopher Cross, by the way. Uh, that when, and this episode is not about Christopher Cross. So anyway, this is uh, we, we are going to be talking today about bands that were once really huge and are now are kind of forgotten, right? So, but I, I will uh, with a little caveat here. So I, I fully realize we both realize that to much of the viewing audience here watching this video today, you know who these bands are. You're very aware of who these bands are. But I think kind of where we're coming from is that. Back when they were huge, probably most of the population knew who these bands or artists were, familiar with the songs and albums and all that kind of stuff. And now, many years later, or a few years later, whatever it might be, if we were Martin, if we were to walk down Times Square in New York City and we were to survey 50 people and ask them who these artists and bands were, what do you think? 80, 90 percent would have no clue, probably. Exactly. And you and you have these conversations and you hit hit the nail on the head, because when I was researching a little, I, I noticed that, you know, you could almost bring up any massive band and find people who don't know who they are. And then sometimes you say, well, OK, I can understand that. And sometimes you say, well, that's on you, because that sounds like you're really out to lunch if you don't know who Led Zeppelin <laughs> is or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, you you're constantly surprised more and more. But that's that's the advance of time. It's things like, um, you know, this fascinating thing. I'm not an expert on this, but it'd be neat to talk to somebody about this. But that whole idea that we've alluded to before about the paring down of radio lists and uh, and what gets played in consolidation and how, you know, even big bands, you know, you used to hear five songs in rotation. Now it's down to two or whatever. That yeah. that sort of thing happens a lot. So, um, so yeah, a lot of this is the idea of bands that, that have fallen completely off the radar. But w- what we love about this is that, um, you know, most of what we're going to talk about here are, again, bands, bands that were actually quite huge. And, and you wonder, wow, how do you forget a band that sold that many records sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've each picked five and uh, we're going to kind of talk, uh, you know, we're going to talk about why were they huge? And we'll probably throw in some sales numbers and things like that. And then, you know, the drop off and where they're at today. So I'll have Martin kick us off with his first selection of the day. Okay. So my first selection is, uh, is this band here, Three Dog Night. Um, you know, it's, they, they've existed in a weird liminal space for me, liminal, liminal. Um, you know, they, they were one of the first bands I ever got into past puff the magic dragon you know like the first rock band sort of thing right um 
uh, because of the Columbia Record Club and at the same time was Creedence Clearwater Revival, which also feels like a little bit of this strange. They're in it, they, they exist in a parallel universe. Them, it's a whole different thing. Just the, the look of them and everything, they seem like a timeless. I've called them a Civil War band right like the band and and ccr seem like that band that could have existed in civil war times right but three dog nights a funny one in the same way and the reason they come up with me is they're they had the captured live at the forum album in 69 which i got into and then the big one for me was this was this um double live album and and i was surprised when looking in this uh this episode how late this is this is 73 so I'm uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I was still listening to Three Dog Night when I was 10 years old. I thought it was all good, proper, heavy stuff by then. But this album really affected me. Um, and I was playing it back a little bit and realized that um, it, it actually has it's it, it can be pretty down and dirty with with big organ sounds and some extreme singing. And they they look kind of like you 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 semi heard about drug problems. They always the pictures of them, they always looked all sweaty and, you know, they had the big handlebar mustaches and everything. Um, but, yeah, this is a band that was absolutely huge at the time. So from 68 to 74, they had eight records out. Uh, they had a platinum followed by seven golds. And so this is all in the States. Right. Um, Plus, they had two gold greatest hits albums, I believe, both right in that same time frame. And both of these live albums went gold. So that's like something like a dozen gold albums. So huge band putting out tons of stuff. One of the reasons they could put out tons of stuff is they were this weird uh, covers band. They basically covered uh, people all the time. It was all outside songwriters sort of thing. Um and uh, big, big band. And, and they were known for for having really good vocals and stuff. But they were they were a big band with a lot of vocals, but they also had, you know, the bandiness thing going on. So when I was playing this stuff, I, you know, because I've always sort of remembered, like, why, why was I into Three Dog Night? Like, it just seemed random. Right. Um, you know, from from sort of 69 through, I guess, up to 73. And but I do realize now playing it back that it, it could be it could be fairly rocky and heavy and energetic, even though and hooky joy to the world and and, you know, uh, Eli's coming and all those sorts of songs. You know, they had quite a few hits, of course, as well. That's how, how you get all these albums. But yeah, I just totally feel like this is a band that that completely is forgotten. And I think one of the reasons might be the idea that they didn't write their own stuff mostly. Right. Could be. And and I, I think one of the things we'll probably touch on throughout this episode is this. Uh, I mean, you know, I, for me growing up, Sorry, Pete, while you're talking, I'm just going to, because I pulled all these out, I'm just going to keep flashing all these ridiculous three dog oh, okay, cool. that I've yeah. got. Yeah, those covers are crazy. Um, you know, back when we were kids, Martin, I mean, there was FM rock radio. It wasn't called classic rock, right? So bands like Three Dog, dog Night, you would hear on the radio all the time. But now with like classic rock radio, it's almost like the the years of what is deemed classic rock has moved up, right? I think we talked about this on a, on a previous episode where now like all of a sudden things that came out in the nineties are considered classic rock and they play on the classic rock station. So a lot of these late sixties, early seventies uh, rock songs that were so huge at the time, you don't really hear anymore on what is called classic rock radio. So like, I, I, I'm, I'm sure if I were to sit for like 24 hours and listen to the local classic rock station here by me, that's been around since the seventies, it would be drastically different what they play as opposed to what they were playing back in the late seventies, early eighties you know yeah and and you and you see videos all the time and people talking nostalgically about uh bands from the 90s and nirvana and even bands from the early 2000s and people are now waxing you know rhapsodically and wistfully about new metal and you know rob zombie and white zombie and stuff it's like wow so so that's now old so yeah, <laughs> yeah. so this stuff is really old right yeah exactly yeah all right, so my uh, my first selection of the day is Peter Frampton. So Peter Frampton was a young kind of star, right? He uh, was in a band called The Herd, and he made his way into Humble Pie alongside Steve Marriott. Uh, fairly big band at the time, but of course, uh, he leaves that band in the early 70s um, and decides to go solo. Right? So he puts out uh, three albums as a solo artist, which did not chart at all. Uh, but then his fourth album from 1975 called Frampton, uh, which went gold and hit number 32 here in the States. All right. So he comes out with uh, a year later, 
this live album, which becomes one of the biggest selling live albums of all time. Okay, 1976, eight times platinum here in the States, number one in the US, number sit number one in Canada as well, number six in the UK, eight in Australia, four in Germany. This does mega, mega business. And it, it probably sets the stage for all those monumental double live albums that come out uh, in the 70s, the latter part of the 70s. You know, he's got the hit single, Baby, I Love Your Way. Um, you know, a slew of hit singles and stuff they're playing on the radio. And all of a sudden, Peter Frampton is, you know, he's got the look, right? He's got the long kind of strawberry curly blonde hair, uh, plays guitar. He's on the cover of all the magazines and all that sort of stuff. You, you can't. You can't hide anywhere around this time and not hear about and see Peter Frampton somewhere or another. So he puts out a follow-up uh, studio album to this, I'm in You, in 1977, which hits number two in the U.S., number one in Canada, but only goes platinum, okay? And by 1979's Where I Should Be, um, things are looking a little bit different. That only hits number 19 here in the U.S., goes gold, and that's his last certified album, believe it or not. Uh, and other than breaking all the rules from 1981, no album breaks the top 50 in any market ever again. He's still around, though. I mean, you know, obviously we know he's uh, been battling some health issues in the years, but uh, his last album came out in 2021. Frampton forgets the words. Um, instrumental stuff, right? He's been fairly, up until recently, he's been fairly busy touring and releasing albums on, you know, smaller labels and things like that. So he hasn't gone away, but man, isn't it crazy when you think about a guy who was literally on top of the world for like about a two year period and then just disappears off the face of the earth um, and just can't sell any albums, can't get in, you know, all the tour and the, the, and the big tours and the arenas and all that kind of stuff. Just, it just went away just like that. And, you know, you obviously old folks like us uh, remember him well, but uh, man, Peter Frampton, you go mention that name anywhere. Like, Who, who's that? Right. Who's that? Oh, is that the, is that the guy? Uh, wasn't, wasn't he like an actor, you know, and he used to be on the cover of all the magazines or whatever. It's like, no, no. Well, he did, did act in one movie though, but yeah. yeah. But uh, after, after this, could you imagine like if this never happened? I mean, he, he'd be completely forgotten as if he, as if he, you know, humble pie, he was in humble pie. What? So uh, yeah, I mean, this is like as perplexing as it gets. And maybe it comes down to the fact that, you know, a lot of those studio albums really weren't all that good. I don't know. I'm not going to judge that, but uh a strange, strange occurrence, the kind of uh, fall from grace of Peter Frampton. Yeah, there's there's a dangerous uh, there's a dangerous blend down to like Bobby Sherman, David Cassidy, Sean Cassidy, Leaf Garrett. Leaf Garrett. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he looks like he looks like a cross between Leaf yeah, Garrett and David Cassidy. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I was uh, I, I knew you were going to talk about Peter Frampton. So uh, so here's some some vinyl, uh, The Art of Control. We've got. Uh, yeah. When all the pieces fit, unopened, marked down from thirteen ninety eight to two ninety nine. Right? Yeah, beat that bargain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's another one. Breaking all the rules. Yeah, premonition. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a vinyl of that. There's wind of change. Wind of change. Where have I heard that before? <laughs> um there's that one yeah i always like that cover so you're saying this this went gold eh yeah yeah wow so this is Last frampton one. frampton so this is the one right before the live album eh yep right before the live album okay all right you got frampton's camel there we go so yeah i i i i barely i i couldn't tell you what anything sounds like on any of these records i've got you know i i just he's just this general he's one of those general artists right just I'm gonna write some songs right they're not, not yeah i style and i've always found him to be a very good guitar player i love his guitar skills uh i like his voice mm -hmm. i honestly never really cared a hell of a lot about most of his material it yeah. to me a lot of it is very unmemorable um if you go see him live he puts on a great show he's got that core of like you know song and they're all on this album right they're they're all here the core of the really strong material is on here i mean some of those albums you you held up i i've heard bits and pieces of those and a couple i've heard in full uh and there's some good material on there but uh a lot of times i'm just kind of like you know i just want to hear him play guitar because i don't find the songs all that memorable and uh maybe that's part of it right you know maybe he just was right place right time for this 
you know, and, uh, but otherwise, you know, just not all that spectacular of, uh, of an artist, maybe, I don't know, but he's got a lot of fans. And I, I don't dislike him at all. It's just amazing. The fall from grace is just amazing with this guy. And um, who knows? And and I think even even like the the uh, you know the meme and the legend of that live album is fading away, and also the songs that are played off that, I think, are falling off of classic rock radio, where it just becomes tidy for them to say, okay, let's just forget about this guy completely. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I I don't know. I I'm going to ask the question, Martin, and then we can answer it. Uh, Frampton comes alive as a great live album. How is it held up for you? Really? I was never even a fan of that. Um, I, I just, I just found it, you know, because at that time we were, we were such, you know, uncompromising metalheads. It just seemed like an annoyance, this, this album that, that was doing well. And, uh, and again, the songs still are just still kind of generally all, all over it. Right. And there's the talk box thing and all that, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, it was one of those situations where, and it's, I'm going to relate this to my next choice here. One of those situations where you were ticked off that this guy's selling so many records and yet you're your Blue Oyster Cult live album and Rush album are struggling, right? And all, all, all that yeah. stuff, right? So Yeah, I, I think it's a decent live album. I never saw the legendary status. You know, there's, there's some stuff on there I do enjoy, but uh, I, I think one of the greatest albums, live albums of all time, eh, not quite. Not yeah, for me. Yeah. Don't dislike Okay, that. my next choice is uh, Loverboy. So the Canadian band Loverboy. Um, the funny thing is, there's just a few of those. What the? I think this may, I don't know, third one or so. I'm. I don't even know the know the order. Maybe this is the third one. Um, but um, the funny thing about this band. So so I just did a a podcast episode of my history and five songs thing called uh, "Was Hair Metal Born in Canada." Uh, and the funny thing about it is there's not even much hair metal from Canada, but there's a lot of this kind of stuff, you know, the whole night, night ranger situation. And, and, uh, so, so I rattled off in this episode, must've been 25 or 30 bands that were in this pre hair metal thing from, from the late seventies through to 1982. And the biggest of them all and the most insistent and persistent of them all was Loverboy. Loverboy was a massive band. Um, and, uh, you know, they got Bruce Fairburn's career off, off, um, off to the races. They're sort of like a Vancouver Calgary amalgamation thing. They're recording in Vancouver, but yeah. So Bruce Fairburn, um, you know, became a big hair metal producer, but it was prism and lover boy prisms. Another one of the, these bands. So it was prism trooper, helix, Coney hatch, Santers, tons and tons of these bands, April wine triumph that, that all fit in this episode. I did about setting the stage with this pop metal, heavy AOR melodic, hard rock, whatever you want to call it, that, that invent that hair metal came later. So Canada specialized in that and then did not do that great in the whole hair metal thing. Right. But so lover boy is, is like the best of these. And like I say, I, I always bring, you know, we always bring up night Rangers too, yeah. as, as one of these bands, but lover boy. So 1980, uh, that album goes double platinum in the States, five times platinum in Canada. Um, Get Lucky, the second one, uh, three times platinum in Canada, four times platinum in the States. Um, Keep It Up, two times platinum in Canada, two times platinum in the States. Um, then they've got Loving Every Minute of It, uh, looks like platinum. 1985, they've got... Uh, Actually, you know, love and every minute of it is the is the 85. So that's platinum, double platinum in the States. Wild Side in 87. So so well into hair metal, right? Yeah. Um, they have an album called Wild Side that goes gold in Canada and gold in the States. So long career, sold a massive amount of albums. And I truly feel that no one really talks about these guys anymore. People kind of have forgotten they've existed. I think they're a great example of this. Um, or maybe I'm just guilty of it and I keep forgetting they exist, right? But um, it, they they ticked us off as kids all the time because it was, you know, we had that idea of CanCon where they were pushing Canadian things on us and, and you resist as a, as a kid. But it wasn't heavy enough either, right? Um and but but I find Mike Reno is is a real sort of um, template for the John Bon Jovi type voice, um, and you know the mix of keyboards and guitars and up tempo and the, and the you know the party themes kind of thing fit as well. Um, the first time I ever saw Loverboy was uh, part of Canadian Music Week here in Toronto. They played like a small church, um, you know, like maybe fifteen years ago, twenty years ago. 
the nicest guys. Mike Reno is hilarious. He's so funny as, as a guy. Right. Um, but, uh, and then, and then I've had a few interviews since, um, you know, they, they even had some comeback albums. The other amazing thing about lover boys are killer live. They're just so good at, at, you know, every guy in that band, there's just, it's one of these like no weak link sort of bands. They're just really got it down what they're doing. Um, but yeah, I, I just think uh, with that massive amount of record sales, um, no one ever talks about this band anymore. And part of it is being from Canada and not moving to the States. Um, that's that's a big thing, too. So so you fall out of the consciousness when you're not physically in the flesh and blood in California all the time sort of thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but what what is what is this band's sort of profile in the States? Well, I mean... I think they are mostly forgotten. However, not to a, not to their core audience from back in the day. I mean, perfect example. You mentioned them as a live act before, so I saw them live this summer, just a couple of months wow. ago, at, at an outdoor, you know, kind yeah. of a venue. But they were on the tour with like it was Sticks, Audio Speedwagon, and Loverboy, and Loverboy went on first. And you know, I think they're very smart guys because they they know that they're probably relegated to opening act status on a tour like that at this point in their career. And so for 45 minutes, all they do is play those radio hits and MTV hits. That's it. I mean, their set is perfect because it's just one song after another. And for people in our age group who were fans and remember all that stuff, it's like nostalgia, right? That they become a nostalgia act. And I remember sitting there and it was, it was a rainy night, right? And all the ladies are standing up and they're dancing and they're singing and having a great time. And to that audience, no, they're not forgotten, but to the general public, I mean, you know, lover boy is, they haven't done anything in 30 plus years. Right. But uh, I think they're, they're, they're playing upon their successes now when they do go out and tour. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you any albums they've released in the last 30 years. I don't know if they're any good, how many there are, I couldn't tell you anything, but, uh, but yeah, they're, they're good live. And, you know, most people I think who were around when these songs were popular, you know, you either hated them or you, or you liked them, right? And so I I remember being entertained by them. Uh, I so how good were they live? Because when I saw them, they were amazing. Were but that's 15, 20 years ago, right? Yeah, no, they were, they were really good, Martin. They, they sounded great. I mean, you know, you know, Mike Reno, obviously, he's put on a few pounds, right? So he looked, looks a little different. But other than that, they sounded great. He sang great. And uh, like I said, they play those songs exactly as you remember them. So it's almost like, you know, putting a he, couple quarters in the jukebox and just, yeah, he looks way different. Like, like, you know, when, when he puts on that weight, his whole physique, and of course he get, looks older, but he, even, even back then he did not look remotely like the same guy who was, no, it was, no. yeah. How like his, voice? Saying, uh, his voice still sounds fine. I, I remember it because I saw them like maybe eight years ago, maybe a little longer, mm -hmm. something like that. At Also at a summertime thing, it was them. It was a tour with them and Night Ranger. And I hadn't seen Loverboy since the 80s. And Mike comes out on stage and I'm like, wait a second, that can't be Mike Reno. And it was, you know, because yeah. he looks like, uh, it looks like Andrew Dice Clay, you know, now with the, but, and he's, but he's trying to get the same look as back in the day, but obviously he's put on a lot of weight, and he's, but he just, and he's just got this jovial kind of like attitude and everything. And I don't remember him being that jovial and just kind of like fun back in the day. So he's, he's changed quite a bit, but yeah, he still sings and the band just, they still sound the same. So. Let me tell you, he he is like Andrew Dice Clay. Uh, like he he literally his humor is that is that sharp, right? And yeah. and the self deprecation and and he's up there and he knows exactly what he looks like. You know, he he's he's well aware of who he is and he's just playing it for fun, right? He is literally he's literally playing that character almost now. It's, it's yeah. really funny. He's, but yeah, when I, when I, the times I've met him, he just kept me in stitches the whole time. He's so funny. That guy. <laughs> he just, he's up there. He looks like Mike, the garbage man, you know, he's got the cut off sleeves and the vest and the bandana. And he's walking around. I was just like, Holy cow. I don't remember this guy being like that back in the day, but yeah, he doesn't take himself too seriously. And I guess he's, he's very aware and he's just plays up on it. And you know, I got to give him credit for that. So yeah, yeah, it's entertaining. I, I will say that. I I, I wonder. I I'm almost getting the impression that that they aren't that forgotten to you and in the states and stuff. And maybe here also as well. It's a little bit of that that you know polite war between Toronto and Vancouver and the, and the divide between you know the rivalry 
and because they they don't really seem like a band that uh, paid a lot of attention to the East Coast. Maybe maybe they're maybe they're like a rush uh, in that they they spent a lot of time in the states, I suppose, and and uh, so that's I guess why why they were sort of big. But I I just don't remember them being really on the radar all the time, anyways. And then and then I look at these record sales and I go, this this sounds like a different world I've totally forgotten about. So yeah, but they, they were pretty big for a while. But that that while was a long time ago. Yeah. So, all right. My next uh, choice here is uh, the Steve Miller Band. So these guys got their start kind of as a uh, psychedelic blues rock band in San Francisco in the late '60s. Right? They were they were pretty active actually. Played live a lot. Played with all opened up for all the great bands of the day. They released a lot of albums. They had like a nice cult following, mostly around California. Um, but none of these albums really charted or anything. So we're like, took them like, you know, 67, 68, 69 into the early 70s. Uh, none of them certified. No, nothing played on the radio, nothing like that until uh, 1973's The Joker, which uh, out of the gate goes up to number two, goes platinum, right? You got uh, title track, perennial FM am at the time hit uh sugar babe i think was also played on the radio as well so all of a sudden like steve miller band kind of like becoming a coming a name uh and then three years later it's kind of a long time back in the day right because you had most bands releasing albums a year sometimes two years so three years later they release uh fly like an eagle makes it to number three goes four times platinum here two times platinum in canada Gold in the UK, all right? So all of a sudden here, again, lots of hit singles, right? The title track, perennial hit single. That's like, you know, we talk about the changes in classic rock radio and how a lot of these artists that back in the day, you would hear five, six or seven of their popular songs in constant rotation. And now it's like dwindled down to like two or three. I mean, this is a perfect example. I think Fly Like an Eagle, the title track is something you still hear today. But a lot of other stuff like, you know, Take the Money and Run and Rockin' Me, right? Which were big hits at the time. Maybe not so much anymore. So then uh, they come back a year later, all right, with Book of Dreams. Number two, U.S., three times platinum here, platinum in Canada, silver in the U.K., all right. Then they take another four years for the next album, which I don't have, which is a Circle of Love. Doesn't even make the top 20. Does squeak gold in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and then we wait till 1982, and they release Abracadabra, which I think by 1982, most people were pretty much putting these guys out to pasture. And Abracadabra becomes like a surprise hit, makes it to number three here, goes platinum here, platinum in Canada. Um, the title track does fairly well on the radio, but the band never hits any significant chart or sales heights ever again. Uh, a few of the radio singles, like I said, still get played on the radio. Uh, you know, you got the Joker, Fog and Eagle, Take the Money and Run, Rock and Me, Jet Airliner from Book of Dreams, uh, and Abracadabra, but probably a couple of those you might not hear much anymore. Uh, Steve Miller did make the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a couple of years back, right, which was kind of noteworthy. But uh, for the most part, uh, all has been silent on the Steve Miller front. Uh, you do hear about him guesting on people's albums here and there. But as a band, right, it's been many, many years since we've seen the Steve Miller band doing anything of significance. Yeah, and that's a good segue to my next choice because I I, I feel like um they should have you know maybe if he would have had a band name or just stuck with Steve Miller or stuck with Steve Miller Band because you get solo albums as well I think right um <clears throat> so yeah it just uh it it's a strange career it, it's it's one where I always I always think of the little sound effects I think of like the the vocal hooks the silly song titles the the silly laid back lyrics you know it it, it it's a band where uh, we we can have I I almost feel like there's an episode here on children's music right that we could do and and this is a band that always struck me as a little bit children's musicy at some times well right? it's funny you bring that up because yeah. I've had conversations with people who were fans of the band before they got big so again we're talking about those yeah. early kind of psychedelic and blues albums and they hate all this hit stuff right because to them it's like the essence of what the steve miller band was all about is completely gone it's like once steve yeah. started selling records he's like oh, i'm just going to be this guy that sings these kind of jokey pop rock songs right and yeah. i won't play much guitar anymore and we'll throw lots of weird synthesizer stuff in there and forget about where he kind of came from and i know like later in his career he started doing like blues albums again and whatnot but uh yeah a lot of people don't like 
the hit albums and and so many people who love the hit albums have never heard those early psychedelic albums right i gotta be honest with you i'm not really a fan of much of the psychedelic stuff i have some of it but it's like some of it's like a little you know but uh the guy was great at writing catchy hooks and melodies i mean that's he discovered that and he made a lot of money doing that and you know god bless him for it but not everybody's into those albums yeah all right so my next choice is uh the Alan Parsons Project, right? Um, so this is a band uh, that's the the, the uh, Edgar Allan Poe one. And then this is kind of neat. This is the, um, uh, how, how do I show this here? Stere stere stereotomy? Okay, so yeah. So it, it's the one where, uh, you know, you get that and then it's in the blue, it's in the blue thing. So you, you see the title that way. And then so... Yeah. So this is a band that, uh, you know, to me, they always struck me as a, as a cross between Pink Floyd, Kraftwerk and Devo in a way, uh, and Steely Dan even, right. The, just the projecty nature of it, the strange band name. So again, uh, you know, Alan Parsons project, it sounds like the Steve Miller band and the Pat Travers band and all that. It's always annoyed me this whole thing. Right. Um, but I, I do see this band often, on on lists or when people have this discussion of whatever happened to them, they were huge sort of thing. Um, you know, they were big in Canada, I guess, is is one of the reasons they came to mind for me as well. But uh, yeah, mostly platinum, double cat platinum in Canada. So Tales of Mystery and Imagination, um, Dozen Certified, iRobot Gold, Pyramid Gold, Eve Gold, uh, Turn of a Friendly Card, Platinum, Eye in the Sky, Platinum, uh, Ammonia Avenue, uh, Gold, Vulture Culture, and then and then you're down into the non-certifying, you know, uh, obviously known uh, working at uh, Abbey Road and worked on, uh, you know, he's like a big part of Dark Side of the Moon. Um, super nice guy. Um, so producer and stuff, but but really didn't do much outside of this, really, uh, in, in any capacity. Um, but yeah, the, these things were just so huge. And then he had the falling out with the partner and stuff. Um, but uh, but yeah, just the, just this band that, um, I, again, it, it just feels like um, it, it feels like like the music is of its time as well, because it was, it was very enthusiastic about trying out different synthesizer -y type stuff. And then I think that band name just uh, annoys people and radio programmers and stuff, and they don't want to deal with it. I always, always joke about how wasp never gets talked about very much in, in print because it's such a pain typing capital W dot a dot <laughs> S dot P dot all the time. Right. And then, no, if it's at the end of a sentence, do you put two periods and then you have that debate with yourself and on and on. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I just, I just thought that, uh, that this is a band that again is it's convenient that there's, there's so few hits that I think all of them will just drop off the classic rock thing at some, at some point. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, this was a band, I think, uh, especially on the albums you mentioned, I think each album had at least one either big to marginal hit on it, which, you know, back in the day helped a lot. If you had singles that were played on the radio, um, that helped the pro I don't think the project name, you know what it is? It's like, it, you almost like he couldn't call it Alan Parsons because if you really look at all those albums, he had like a cast of musicians that usually worked on every album. And you, you always, I, I remember always like pouring over the liner notes and think, well, what did Alan actually do on these albums? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, he, he wrote or co-wrote most of the songs and maybe he did the arranging or the conducting of, uh, you know, orchestral stuff and played some synthesizer and things like that. But it's not like he was singing all the songs. It's not like he was playing keyboards on all the songs. He had guys there who did lead vocals and guitars and, and everything else. So I think the whole project name maybe has like a negative connotation, sort of. Yeah. Um, but you can't just call it Alan Parsons because it's about all these other guys for the most part. So, I mean, really, you could have you could have taken his name off of there and just gave this band some other name. And I don't think the results would be any different. And maybe they'd be looked at a little bit differently. So I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. good stuff. I mean, and again, you, what do you call the music? Yeah. Eric, Eric Wolfson, right? He's Eric Wolfson. Yep. The yep. Hue, right. Yeah. There's Andrew Powell down there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was a core group of guys that were on just about every album and they had they had a sound. I mean, you, you generally when you heard an Alan Parsons project song, you kind of knew it was them, but they kind of didn't really fit anywhere. Right. They kind of the stuff was some of the stuff was kind of proggy and art rock 
lot of it was pop. Some of it was like electronic. NCC, ELO, you kind of put them in that thing. Yeah, yeah. They don't really, yeah. yeah, they didn't really fit anywhere too neatly. But they were, I, you know, cool band. I, I, I like a lot of their albums actually. But mm -hmm. um, it's, but yeah, and the name is weird. And I don't know if they were ever, they were, they were consistently like a good selling band like and, and they, didn't, they didn't tour a lot either right that didn't help them right. um so yeah i i think they're pretty forgotten these days by most people you know other than you know obviously if you're a fan and you were around at the time you remember them well but um people who started listening to music in general over the last 30 years they, they probably don't have a clue who alan parson project is which is a shame all right Let's go. Uh, how about a super group that got hastily put together and became really, really big, really, really quick. And then you untie the bottom of that balloon, Martin, and there it goes. Right. So Asia. Right. 1982 double album. All right. So here you got uh, John Wetton, of course, who comes on board from UK and King Crimson and Roxy Music and Family and Uriah Heep and am I missing anything? I'm sure he was in other bands that I'm forgetting about. Uh, Carl Palmer from Emerson, Lincoln Palmer and Atomic Rooster. You got uh, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Downs who comes over from Yes. Steve Howe, of course, from Yes. And uh, they put together this band called Asia. This goes a surprising four times platinum here in the U.S., three times platinum in Canada, gold in the U.K., France, Sweden, Australia. It makes it to number one in the U.S. This is just an immensely popular album, which when you think about it, this is 1982. So arguably eight to ten years past prog rock's heyday. Uh, but surprisingly, it's not a prog album at all. I mean, I, that, I think that's the reason why it did so well. So you got these prog legends who came together and, and put together a very memorable slick pop rock album right and it does big business they go out on tour they play all over the place and all of a sudden asia is like the big band of 1982 so they come back uh in the year later and they release alpha again more roger dean artwork that does, that also helps the whole thing um this only makes it to platinum here in the U.S. and Canada, silver in the U.K., and all subsequent releases with fractured lineups and whatnot fail to chart, and all of a sudden the phenomenon that is Asia kind of leaves without a trace. I always thought that this follow-up album came out a little too quickly. <clears throat> it sounds kind of rushed. I think it lacks the, um, I don't know, the vibrancy and the catchiness of the debut, or maybe this whole idea of the supergroup kind of ran its course already. Because, you know, by 83, 84, we've talked about it for the last couple of weeks, you know, hair metal and thrash and all that kind of stuff are the, are the more popular uh, music things that are happening out there in the rock world. So maybe this was inevitable. All of a sudden, these sugary, sweet harmonies and melodies and stuff is kind of out of favor. But they, they, had, they were massive for like about a two-year period. Stuff played on the radio, he the moment, only time will tell, don't cry, soul survivor, wildest dreams, the smile has left your eyes and go, go from a, a album that came out after this one. All big to moderate hits, but uh, they kind of went away for a bit. They had a, a band called Asia, which had almost none of the original members in there for quite a long time. Then they reformed with the classic lineup. Uh, their last studio album came out in 2014. None of the, the reformation albums did much of anything sales wise. Uh, the band still continues to tour with various lineups. Every time you they play live, like every summer, you go see them. You never quite know who's in the band or whatnot. John Wenton has since passed away. Steve Howe comes in and out of the band. Carl Palmer is usually there. Jeff Downs is usually there and uh, with all sorts of assorted other people. But yeah, I mean, this was a band that had, I think, a really small shelf life. And I think out of a lot of the bands we're going to be talking about today, it's probably not surprising that they're mostly forgotten today, except for like, you know, long time prog rock people who remember them. Finally. Yeah. They're almost like a vehicle for good album covers, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, most of the album covers are great, right? Yeah, Can't yeah. argue that. But beyond that, yeah, I mean, I, 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 Martin, I'll be the first to tell you, other than this debut, I can't say I really like any of the other albums all that much. I like tracks here and there, but for me, the only album that's consistently good is the debut. The rest of it's like, you could probably take the best songs from all the other albums and you've got, and there, there's a lot of them. Uh, I mean, you've got maybe a great, pretty, pretty cool double album there. That's about it. Yeah. All right. So to move it along, cause I think we've been going a long time here. Um, I'm going to go with soul asylum next. Um, soul asylum are the part of, 
of that whole Minneapolis scene. They're almost like the um, the heavy metal version of the Replacements. They're they're the band that had a lot of riffs to what they do. I love all their early material. We've got this the Say What You Will, and of course Hang Hang Time is an amazing album. Um, this is when they started making it a little bigger, and we've got the A and M album and not, and the horse they rode in on was really cool. Um, and then you know they they. They struck it big uh, after that a little bit with, uh, well, more than a little bit with uh, with the whole Grave Dancers Union album. So Dave Perner was kind of like the it guy going out with Winona Ryder on the cover of Rolling Stone. Uh, then then they kind of did the same thing over again, same green album cover. And then kind of at that point, all the all the, um you know, the old school fans that love the heavy stuff, the punky stuff, the slightly hardcore stuff, the replacement C sort of stuff. Um, you know, started to go away because they kind of stayed with uh, with this pretty mainstream uh, alternative sound. But he was he was an absolute absolutely a big deal. Uh, but that that early twin tone stuff is all uh, absolutely classic. So <laughs> Grave Dancers Union that was ninety two. It went double platinum. Um, Let your dim light shine, which was a dim light version of Grave Dancers Union, really uh, went platinum, and then that was it. The bloom was off. Everything since then, um, you know, kind of went downhill. But uh, yeah, it was qu- it was quite surprising to see. You know, at the same time, Husker Du had their uh, or Husker Du had their had their moment in the sun as well and so did the replacements these these bands were all fairly hyped um but this was the only one uh, who the heck is the other one so ask you do i think there's another one anyways firehose sort of um uh actually yeah from ohio mixed with minute man all these bands are, are kind of like, rains, you know yeah like... yeah yeah um but really it's only soul asylum that actually broke out from this and yeah i, I can still picture that cover of rolling stone to this day when when these guys were big but they were they were a big deal for for a, a time there but uh you know as with all all things uh, alternative and hard alternative or, or whatever uh the bloom kind of of wore off but these guys kind of you can they have to kind of blame themselves because they, they really did seem like a band that said oh wow this commercial stuff's working we're going to keep doing this and they so they became kind of like a brash abrasive alternative version of the whole bruce springsteen billy joel john mellencamp bon jovi sort of new jersey sort of thing right that the the uh, melodies became more maudlin and there was more acoustic guitar and they became a little more americana and they and they lost the stuff that made hang time you know for example such a great album yeah i mean a lot of bands did that they lost their core audience because it kept kind of like changing their sounds to go along with the times and the 90s was just such a weird decade for that right you had every couple of years you had something new that was coming out that was catching on for a bit that didn't really last too long and you had so many of these bands who just never really figured out where they fit and what they should be doing um, and I think the ones that that made it kind of stuck to their core sound because eventually everything gets back in favor at some point, right? So what comes around goes around, right? So, but yeah, they were they were a pretty big band for a few years. I mean, yeah. you see those albums everywhere. Yeah, where are they today? Well, well, <laughs> and you and and for a long time you saw the CDs of those albums everywhere because they were all a dollar, right? And they were returned, uh, right? It's they a, were just a regular, a, yeah. They were just like the profusion, and that's that's such a crazy thing about about the '90s when you know me and you, I, I suppose you as well, were getting sent a lot of CDs, right? Um, and uh, and you know the alternative stuff, yeah, that that stuff just piled up. Some of it hit, some of it didn't, but then then you just saw them in stores in droves right yeah the deluge yeah Ugh. crazy time all right my next uh choice here is super tramp great british band so uh you know early on in their career you had uh, albums like uh, crime of the century and uh you've been in their quietest moments and crisis what crisis these are all very well you know one classic but these were all moderate sellers right so uh eventually all of these three went either gold or platinum but again the band not huge by any means then throughout the 70s but you know decent steadily selling band but it wasn't until uh 1979's breakfast in america um which hits either one two or three in the sales charts and basically every major market across the world um goes multi-platinum everywhere i mean this was like a ridiculous phenomenon 
uh, where you, when you look at what came before it, which were all moderate sellers, uh, hit singles all over the place on here, you know, Logical Song, Goodbye Stranger, the title track, you know, you used to play these songs all over the place. And I think the success of this album and these singles uh, made the singles from the previous albums, which did okay at the time, made them even more popular. So all of a sudden, like Super Tramp is this like enormous band. And again, what do you call these guys, right? Just kind of like like Alan Parsons Project. What is this? Are they a pop band? Are they a prog band? Are they an art rock bands? I don't know. It's just whimsical, clever type stuff uh, that really caught on big. But you know, then they wait like three years. To, for this to come out famous last words still goes platinum most of the uh most of the places around the world uh but i think already the years have passed people are now listening to you know new wave is still kind of out there there's the whole brit pop thing you got uh, hair metal and thrash and other things just right around the corner and by the mid late 80s uh the band have basically fallen clear out of the mainstream never achieved that kind of success again the band kind of implodes you got roger hodson who forms the the great duo there um he leaves the band for a solo career and the band have since done nothing at all since 2002 they've been really quiet i'm not even sure if they're still together i don't know uh but to most people probably figured that they broke up after this with actuality they didn't they actually released a couple of really good albums after this but nobody was real buying them so uh yeah and a band that you know you could still hear on classic rock radio you still hear some of those you know a couple of those hits you probably still hear bloody well right from climb crime of the century a couple of tracks from breakfast in america maybe one or two others and that's probably about it but uh yeah kind of forgotten though which is a sad because really really good catalog the 70s albums are and the early 80s albums are quite quite good it's funny as the years go on you know, in, in an imagined world where there is actual radio station disc jockey independence, when I'm driving around and I hear a Super Tramp song come on, I almost can picture the DJ going, boy, I feel uncool playing this. <laughs> right. You know, it's almost like you can hear the wheels turning going. I don't think we're going to be playing this too much longer because it just feels I really feel silly playing this again right yeah well because yeah it's it's a style of music that just really hasn't been in fashion in so long and uh i will i, I love super tramp I, but i will admit their music is not like hip right i can i can see like young people today here in super tramp they're like uh what's up with those high-pitched vocals and uh there's there's not a lot of guitar here and it's just they're just these kind of like whimsical little you know happy kind of songs and yeah i get that i get it and then maybe that's why they're kind of forgotten, right? That's that they're, I don't know, like, like a band like Journey, Martin, right? Whether you love them or not, has albums and songs that I think are going to be timeless. There's always going to be people that are into, you know, like a song like Don't Stop Believing, right? You, people may hate it because they've heard it a million times, but people will be playing that 30 years from now. <clears throat> the Super Tramp stuff, maybe not so much. I don't know how, as much as I love Super Tramp, I don't know how timeless some of that stuff is and maybe that's why yeah. well it, it's almost like the the yacht rock end of pomp rock right it's it's a little bit like city boy again 10 cc uh almost like a, a like a uh pop version of gentle giant yeah 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 that's yeah. a good analogy yeah. Yeah, yeah. weird band all right my last one uh mm -hmm. is is almost like uh, you know what one, one of the few poster poster childs for this situation that everybody thinks about when you bring up this topic and that's creed yeah. um so creed my own prison uh we've got we've got weather here and human clay and you know my my story with creed always that i bring up it's a very short story but i just remember interviewing them in person down at the attic records office here in toronto and someone poked their head in the door in the interview and said oh by the way your album just went gold like they were hearing about it literally in the middle of this interview which was funny but they were super nice guys and stuff and obviously um you know musically um they they got they got some abuse immediately for being like uh are they pearl jam uh uh clones uh you know does scott have the yarl right remember what the yarl the yarl is the uh is the uh is the eddie vetter grunge accent right and so here's a guy with the yarl as well um so they seemed like uh like just a 
slightly heavier version of Pearl Jam. And then overlaid with that was the whole, are they a Christian rock band thing? Um, so, but yeah, so my own prison, uh, eventually went six times platinum and a uh, human clay, 11 times platinum. Um, so it's diamond weathered six times platinum. And then they had a follow-up called full circle, which did not certify at all. And then you had the drama with Scott Stapp, you know, you know, going a little crazy, then going solo alter bridge with Mark Tremonti did rather well. So, you know, there was an offshoot band that, that he has a good reputation. Again, these guys were really nice guys. I, I, I thought, um, but, uh, just just a, such a massive band with an 11 times platinum album and you really don't hear uh, uh, them talked about at all they, they literally are are talked about with this narrative all the time it's like wow they were huge and wow nobody ever talks about them so i i think they're they're perfect for this episode yeah and you know what's amazing too uh i mean the sales numbers are just crazy but like you talk to people now uh and you mention creed and everybody says oh yeah creed they were horrible yeah like 50 million people bought those records so that i mean yeah, exactly it's ridiculous that's such I mean, a good everybody point. has yeah. these horrible memories of them it's like why yeah it's like then why were you yeah. i mean people were buying that stuff in droves and seeing them live it's just it's crazy how big they yeah. were they really were yeah. huge for those couple of years and how that well it's that's that it's, last it's album almost just, another episode there right that yeah. that idea like you you hit the nail on the head because the the two the two other ones i think about all the time also in that respect are kid rock and limp biscuit right yeah yeah huge you know huge huge sales but you you mention them and the first thing they say wow they're horrible right yeah yeah we we did uh on the hudson valley squares last this past week we did a show about uh columbia house and bmg you know the mail order uh clubs and all that and ryan scow brought up uh one of the selections he got sent that he didn't want but he forgot to send in the card was one of those stained albums that's another band right who were really big right around this time that now when you when you mention their name like oh stained they were terrible it's like wow yeah tons of people were into them back in the day you know, for sure, Creed. Yeah, that's that's a great selection. Creed is a great yeah. one. And I, I think, too, uh, I think there's still a little bit of the the Creed hate stigma that um, follows Alter Bridge around a little bit, which Alter Bridge, to me, are a completely different band, even though, you know, three quarters of the band are from Creed, uh, along with Miles Kennedy. And uh, I think that just people have this bad taste in their mouth from the end of creed that they refuse to give alter bridge a chance and i think alter bridge are a really really fine band um then again you know may are they that much different than what creed were doing yeah maybe a little bit i think definitely heavier right they have more like a metal sound but um yeah it's crazy but uh, so that's what like 20 million I, I i forget the so 11 million 6 million i mean so probably yeah, over 20 yeah, million and, and sales six, right and six yeah just just for those and that's just america right yeah so that's crazy all right, our final selection of the day uh, is Martin's favorite band, Grand Funk Railroad. So I, I'm a big fan, right? So I've been listening to Grand Funk for a long time. But man, when I was going and doing the research on some of these albums, it's crazy how big Grand Funk were for uh, a, a few short years. And again, most of these bands we're talking about like short bursts of popularity. Um, but from like 1969 through 1974 i mean grand funk were one of the bigger bands on the planet as far as like you know concert ticket sales and albums so bear with me folks here i'm going to go through a few of them so their debut on time from 1969 goes gold here in the states 1969 also they released two albums that year this is their uh uh yeah grand funk album 1969 this goes platinum closer to home 1970 two times platinum their live album, also from 1970, two times platinum. Survival, also from 1970, three albums in one year, platinum. 1971's E Pluribus Funk, platinum. 1972's Phoenix, gold. 1973's We're an American Band, back to platinum. Shining On, 1974, gold. And also in 1974, all the girl, all the all the girls in the world, beware! One of the worst album covers of all time. Also goes gold. They had 19 top 100 singles. I'll name some of them: We're an American Band, The Locomotion, Bad Time, Shining On, Foot Stomping Music, Some Kind of Wonderful, Walk Like a Man, Close to Home, I'm Your Captain, many, many more. 
So this is a band that were really, really big, especially here in the States. I know uh, you talk to people like in the UK and they're like, ah, Grand Funk was never a thing uh, there. But here they were they were really something. They had they were a young band. They had a guy named Terry Knight, who was their manager and producer, and he was a promoter in a big way. So they had sold tons of concert tickets. In fact, they, they're in the Guinness Book of World Records as uh, they beat the Beatles record of selling out Shea Stadium in under 72 hours. So they sold 50,000 tickets in under 72 hours, which at the time was like a big, big deal. The critics hated them. The fans loved them. They sang. Their lyrical content was all about, you know, anti-war stuff, anti-government, the whole hippie counterculture thing. And that really resonated with uh, with the young kids. Uh, but by 1976, basically all that uh, all that's kind of ended. You know, the the oncoming rush of punk, I think, kind of put to rest uh, Grand Funk Railroad. Uh, Mark Farner eventually leaves the band in, in, as we move into the 80s. Uh, but they continue to tour. Um, you know, Don Brewer, Mel Scatcher, two original members still in the band. You got Bruce Kulick, longtime member of Kiss, plays guitar. Max Carl sings and plays guitar. He's formerly a 38 special. Tim Cashion on keyboards. So they still go out there and they still play the summer circuits, playing all the hits, but they haven't released any new material, any new albums since the early 80s. And, uh, you know, kind of forgotten other than the aging classic rock concert circuit of the summertime uh and you know you still hear some of these on classic rock radio some of these hits but uh but yeah this was a massive massive band for about five or six years big time nice but did they have as much cultural impact as dan fogelberg platinum double platinum platinum double platinum double platinum double platinum gold gold plus a three times platinum greatest hit sell yeah so, uh, crazy who is more important to uh to i don't know literature and art and music and culture grand the funk or dan the, fogelberg the fogelberg thing is interesting because <laughs> if you look at a lot of those big selling albums he really he sold those albums all those sales on the strength of the albums because he was not a big radio guy you know other than uh you know loneliness right i mean it really didn't have many hit singles yeah so yeah. that that style of kind of folk rock was was driven based on album sales and not about airplay which is really really interesting because i had i had no idea he was that big of a seller but very consistent in his catalog yeah yeah so as, as you can see i'm into the honorable mentions here and this is one i, I consider doing but i just don't know much about him but i looked up a few of these people but uh yeah so so as an honorable mention i i had a, a couple of couple of well let me mention this first of all wait i i noticed a um on a Reddit thread, um, some people were talking about this, and I thought this was an interesting comment. Um, Jewel, uh, Lisa Loeb, Liz Fair, Cheryl Crow, Suzanne Vega, Natalie Merchant, and then dot, 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 this person said pretty much all of the Lilith Fair crowd. And that got me thinking of your Janice Ians and Melissa Manchester's and uh, even Carly Simon. So so a lot of, you know, that those, those 70s solo female artists, and then apparently... Um, you know, people are, are, I guess, conjecturing that, you know, the, the whole the whole Lilith Fair type uh, female artists have been somewhat forgotten as well. So that's another. One. Yeah. Yeah. True. You know, like Susie and the Banshee. And uh, yeah, there, there were. Yeah, there were a lot of I think a lot of the the female artists who got really, really big very, very quickly and then kind of faded away and almost were like replaced by the next one that came around. Mm -hmm. You saw quite a lot of that, especially like in the late 80s and the early 90s. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember being on the on the Chardet train and the Suzanne Vega train. And in Canada, we had Jane Sibbery up here. who was a big hit for a little while. A uh, cup, couple other quick ones. Um, you know, th this this is a band that gets brought up a lot. Blues Traveler. Oh, yeah. Um, the whole yeah. and then someone mentioned the whole, um, you know, you, you can put them in with the whole jam band situation. So uh, remember how big spin doctors were for a minute, yep. right? Yep. And so, you know, I don't I don't know the reason I don't know this field well enough, but, uh, you know, one thought came to me is is like uh, with the with the death of Jerry Garcia and there not being an official actual, you know, stamped Grateful Dead anymore sort of thing. And then and I just feel like, you know, when you lose the patron saint of of jam bandness, uh, maybe it becomes a bummer. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, I, we, Dave Matthews band and fish, you know, I don't know how forgotten or not those bands are because I was never into them widespread panic, uh, all that whole scene. I don't know much about it, but a blues traveler, I don't know where my stats, but I think they had one of these is six times platinum. 
Yeah, they had one huge Crazy. selling album. Another one that was like, if you if you hold them up, the one you just held up was a big seller for them. Right. And then the other one with the kind of cartoony cover, that That's also one, did. Yeah, that, that did pretty well. And then the other one with the, four, yeah, the cat four. or whatever the hell it is. Yeah, that did pretty well as well. Four, four was the big one, yeah. Yeah, I had all of those. And that band literally killed me on the harmonica for the rest of my life. Yeah, After, I, I just could not get into those albums at all. I'm like, man, this is I I don't I don't mind like a little harmonica here and there, but man, when you got a band that plays in every song, I'm like, oh, and I just could not get into that stuff. Yeah, right. yeah, I got a few more to name off here, but do you do you do you got any yourself any? Yeah, I mean, I got uh, I got two of them. I got a uh, Little River Band, okay, uh, Australian band. So I mean, they had a string of gold and platinum albums in Australia and the U.S. Oh, just uh, from one their of those, debut those in show. 1975 and until like 81's Time Exposure. Lonesome Loser, Reminiscing, and Lady, really, really big songs. But yeah, by like the mid 80s, poof, they were kind of done. Uh, and then 38 Special, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, from yeah. 81's Wild Eyed Southern Boys all the way through like Special Forces, Tour de Force, all platinum albums, tons of hit singles. And then the band never charts again, despite, you know, they're still, they still were releasing albums up till about like a decade ago and still touring regularly as kind of like a Southern rock, you know, pop nostalgia act. But uh, yeah, really, really big for a few short years in the eighties. And, and then that's it. Nothing. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah. You know, another one, I, I went on a buddy of mine shows, Grant, Grant Arthur has a YouTube show called uh, Grant's Rock Warehouse. And we did a, uh, our sweet forgotten show. Um, so, so we had a good conversation on the nature of, of the term forgotten and forgotten where and forgotten how, and, you know, I mean, this is, this is kind of like a one hit wonder band in a way, one hit over here, but many hits overseas. I, I did a sweet book, which is, I think it's now all gone. There might be four copies left or something, but I'm, I don't think I'm going to reprint it. But the funny thing about that book is that a lot of them sold in Europe and barely any of them sold in America. So I was constantly dealing with overseas postage. That's a whole nother story, but, but it proved to me the fact that, um, you know, Germany was a big market for them and, and, you know, none of us on the show really could, could ascertain or remember how big they actually were it, at home in the UK. But because that whole, that whole glam period is, is interesting and full of forgotten bands that whole 71 to 74 UK glam scene. Right. But, you know, over here, this is a band that never really made it. They had the one gold record and they had Fox on the run and ballroom blitz. And then, and then they kind of died. But, but now, you know, the nature is, you know, in our little hard rock world, we know them as pretty important for having some great heavy metal songs. Um, but uh, is this a band that really just did, you know, is going to be forgotten? Um, and then a few others that, that, um, you know, I saw in, in sort of my research along the way, Jay Giles band, um, We've got the likes of Christopher Cross, who we talked about earlier, Jefferson Airplane, people talk about this way, Stray Cats, mm -hmm. remember that whole rockabilly uh, phase that uh, happened, um, Three Doors Down, Atlanta Rhythm Section, Paul Williams, <laughs> remember him, he was, he was kind of a big deal at a time, right? Um, people posited the idea of Mountain, Bachman Turner Overdrive, the Hollies is a great one, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. America is a great one, I think, <laughs> yeah. right, as well. Um, people talk about ABC Doobie Brothers. I don't know. I think the Doobies had some good, good lasting ace, ace of bass. Um, who else do we have? I, I, I considered putting in Bay City Rollers. Um, but yeah, Slade T Rex, Wallflowers, Tim Buckley, Graham Parker, and the Rumor. Ah, Happy Monday, Stone Roses. I don't know. I mean, a lot of these need some debate, and I don't really know much about them. But yeah, I thought the Jay Giles one was pretty good. Guess who people talk about as well. Big Head Todd and the Monsters, Nora Jones, Enya. So you got a few more female solo artists there. But uh, yeah, someone will have to do a sociological study on why why these female artists are all forgotten, right? Yeah. People say that in this in rap too. People say in, in hip hop, you could be massive one day and then gone. And when you're gone, you are forgotten, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and you have to wonder, is that is that on the artists themselves or is it on the music listeners, right? Do, are we, as in general, that fickle where, you know, what's cool today is uncool tomorrow and we just, we don't stick with anything long enough? I don't know. I don't know. I was just yeah. thinking like a lot of the bands we talked about today, um, 
I was thinking of uh, while we were talking. I was thinking, well, what about the bands that were that were not forgotten that are always going to be remembered? And I started thinking about like the Stones and Zeppelin and the Beatles and the Eagles, and I mean, you can go on and on and on. And I think a lot of them are always going to be remembered because of the music and because of them as like personalities larger than life rock stars and personalities ozzy and all these people will forever be remembered not just because of you know the music they created but who they were and i look at some of these bands like super tramp and steve miller band and you know a few others i mean do you really know much about them as people do you you know do you really see lots of interviews with them were they on the magazine covers and all that kind of stuff not really right yeah. So sometimes maybe the music alone is not enough to carry you over from decade to decade to decade. It's like the, the personalities always seem to shine as well and be remembered. And sometimes just as important, sometimes the image is just as important as the actual music itself. I don't know. Yeah. And, and staying, making new albums, but that's less important than staying and staying and playing live. And then the caveat of staying and playing live is you got to stay fairly big playing live so if you continue on selling lots and lots of tickets or even say the headliner sells lots of tickets but you're still on that tour that's all that's all really important like your lover boy example right yeah earlier on right so uh yeah yeah it's funny um yeah you know people have been there there has been some interesting starting to be discussions i've noticed among super led zeppelin experts about led zeppelin in danger of being forgotten so wow you know once you start getting to that level it's like what what is not going to be forgotten right well i mean you have to look i mean let's go into our crystal ball so 20 years from now you know obviously we, we don't need to do the math we know how old we're going to be uh and a lot of people who are maybe a little bit older than us who have been into zeppelin since the beginning they may not be around anymore. So the, the longer the time goes, the more the people that were that experienced Led Zeppelin in their heyday are not here anymore. So you have to assume that the vast majority of younger people who are discovering older rock music, uh, not all of them are going to take to Led Zeppelin like we all did, right? So when we're all not around anymore, who's left to talk about and worship Led Zeppelin? Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. That's a scary thought, right? Yeah. And then there's those odd little blips like that Doors revival of the early 80s, right? When the uh, American Prayer was out and, the, and the, the big book was out and then his Jim's poetry all got reissued and he was on the cover of Rolling Stone again. And so, you know, you know, over the decades to come, you could have these odd situations where and, and it could be a TikTok thing, right? A TikTok song takes off or whatever or, or Stranger Things, you know, with uh, with Kate Bush and Metallica or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it, there, there could be weird little revivals of bands that we can't even predict who, who might have been completely minor bands. Right. Yeah. At some point. But uh, Never know. yeah. Yeah. It'd be good to hear. Uh, you know, so it, it, it'd be good to talk to some experts about why the female artist thing, why the hip hop thing, why the radio playlist thing, like, like to hear what, hear, hear the actual experts talk about, you know, what, why they think, uh, you know, social, sociologically speaking, and in, in some of these respects, why, or, or even just the industry reasons why uh, certain things happen in certain genres different from ours. Right. Yeah. yeah. Here you have it, everybody. Uh, Huge bands who are now kind of forgotten. I'm sure there's some that we have forgotten to discuss today, but that's uh, up to you guys in the comments below to bring up some bands who were, whether it's the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, who were really big for a little bit and then just kind of faded from view and nobody talks about them anymore. So uh, that was the topic of the day. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Martin, give us a little update on uh, books you got ready to ship and podcast updates, contrarians, all that good stuff. Yeah, the big book thing is the, uh, is the uh, hang on. A sample that was sent a while ago still kicking around on top of my turntable so the so this is the big one that just came in uh and i had to order some more it comes in a slip case like this so uh it's a basically a coffee table book history of dark side of the moon and uh you know in the in the old that thing happens and then it goes in here like this and uh so yeah, that just came in. That's at my website right now. It's a little pricey, but not as pricey as the Bowie. So that's martinpopoff.com. Of course, I still got the uh, audio podcast, History in Five Songs. We've got the video show, Contrarians. Cool, cool. 
So stay tuned, everybody. We got coming up on Sunday. We got ranking the albums with uh, the great Norwegian progressive metal band Communix. That's happening on Sunday, and then uh, we'll see you on Tuesday for in the prog seat next week. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. All together, all the damn time for Martin Popo, Find Pete Pardo. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and click on that notification bell uh, so you get alert of all of our content as it posts. And please do hit the like button before you leave. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week here on in the fun house. Take care.